Entrepreneur MBA podcast purpose is to help existing business owners grow their companies past the $10 million in revenue per year benchmark. Here is your host, Stephen Halasnik. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Halasnik, and I am co-founder of Financing Solutions. Financing Solutions provides easy to set up lines of credit for small businesses. And I will be your host for today's Entrepreneur MBA podcast. If you're interested in learning more about our business uh, line of credit program, and I, I honestly tell you that I really passionately believe that every business owner should have a line of credit just in case, and that's our tagline. And uh, just visit our website at fscreditline.com. Again, FS as in financing solutions, creditline.com. Over the last 25 years, I have built six companies in the $5 million to $25 million range, including two companies on the Inc. 500 fastest growing uh, list in the United States. I love learning from people with business experience. And today I am excited to be speaking with John Ostenson from Fran. Bridge Consulting. Uh, John is a is a top one percent franchise consultant nationally, and he leads Fran Bridge Consulting as a CEO. John draws on his experience as a former Inc. 500 franchise president and a multi brand franchisee in serving his clients. John is the author of the best selling books Non Food Franchising, and is a frequent contributor on franchising for publications such as Forbes Inc. Bloomberg, and the Franchise Journal. John, welcome to today's Entrepreneur MBA podcast. Stephen, thanks for having me. Looking forward to our discussion. I did say the last name right. Austinson, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's close enough. What we, is we, it? We, we everything. It's, it's like Austin, Texas. Austinson. Austinson. Yeah, I said it right before, but I got, before I got <laughs> on the air. So there's my dyslexia coming through. So it sucks. Not great for a podcast uh, host to have dyslexia. So anyway, uh, um, today's topic, a uh, fun topic for me, because I don't, you know, it's the holy rail of owning a business and that is to franchise it. And I, if you don't know that, uh, it, you'll learn after today, you know, a little bit about why I, I happen to have a little experience about this topic, which is five why franchising is so popular with experience, entrepreneurs. I have experience in that. So I met, I went to an amazing conference. I uh, Not conference, but I went for a three-year program at, at MIT for uh, a master's class in entrepreneurship. And um, it wasn't like an MBA entrepreneurship uh, thing. It was, uh, it was run by MIT and Inc. Magazine where they took – 60 of the fastest growing companies in the United States. And you, you went for one full week every year and they brought amazing people in to talk to you about how to grow your business. And it was the best learning experience I've ever had. And one of the guys that came and I, I forgot his last name, his first name is George. And he is like the king of franchises. He started uh, Boston market. Um, he started four franchises and um he just in other words you know he took these can these these organizations uh majorly like thousands of franchises he started from scratch and uh and he did that and then i also met the guys who started jiffy lube as well and he it, it you know it's just such an amazing uh proven successful business model to franchise your business um, do you, do you know those, the guys I'm talking about at all? Yeah. don't know them personally, but certainly know some of their of back stories. Yeah. Hey, he passed away recently, George, I forgot his last name. Anyway. Um, so, so, you know, today's topic again is, you know, covering why franchising is so popular with entrepreneurs. Why is franchising so popular? Yeah. You know, I think more and more people are waking up to the fact that there are a lot of different types of opportunities that franchising holds. And, you know, my personal bias is is that there are easier ways to make money than the food industry. And we, we're certainly grateful for those that get into food. But, um, you know, when you look at the capital required to start up, the operating hours, the teams, the inventory, th there's just easier paths to it to scale a business. Um, and so we're seeing clients of ours and others in the market get involved in things like property services, you know, kind of those non 
sexy, cash flowing, boring businesses, as I call them. They're more needs based uh, in nature, you know, and then things like oil changes or, you know, certainly health and wellness is an area of interest. So I think fitness is a little bit crowded. There are other areas of health and wellness. And, you know, Stephen, someone that I say, you know, we've been talking about a recession for the past 10 years. And eventually, if this, you know, predicted recession ever comes and economy gets a little soft out there, you know, what kind of business do you want to be positioned in? And I go back to, hey, what are people going to spend on regardless of the economy? It's what they care about their kids, their pets, their aging population, you know, their aging parents you know, their health, their homes. And so I think businesses that cater to these areas, um, so that's, that's one reason is that people are waking up to the fact there's more opportunities. They understand also more and more the financial returns that can be made. And I do think there's an element of COVID also caused a lot of people to question the path they're on, um, you know, and say maybe now it's time to make a move. But, you know, most of our clients keep their day job or they keep their existing business and they're looking to um to get something going on the side and kind of build out the portfolio and right now when they look at their investment portfolio there's you know there there's the public securities there's bitcoin there's crypto there's only so so many good real estate uh, deals to be had and so with this record level of cash sitting on the sidelines they're looking to deploy it oftentimes in the form of business ownership oftentimes in franchising Let's talk about the benefits of franchising for, uh, let's say you have a pretty, what you think you have a good business right now, right? And you're, you're like, oh, listen to this podcast. Maybe it might be a good idea. You know, my understanding, I'm just off the top of my head is, you know, one, it just seems like, and you know, and I've studied McDonald's and some of the other ones that franchise early on, you get you often get highly motivated people who are willing and want to get a franchise. So you're really getting access to people who are highly motivated. Number two is you, they, they got to pay you up front. They got to pay you something up front. <laughs> and then you have a reoccurring revenue stream after that. And so, you know, I've, I've seen some examples where people who went to franchise didn't ask for any money up front. And that was not really the smartest thing to do. Um, It kind of doesn't pre-qualify the person that, you know, like McDonald's, my understanding at long time ago, you need to have at least a million dollars in in net worth to be qualified to buy for a franchise. Um, Is that, what, what other things? Is that all true what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I think from a franchisor standpoint, so if you're looking to scale your business through franchising, you know, one, you're able to do it using other people's money, right? Obviously, yep. and as, as you eloquently highlighted, you know, they people are putting skin in the game. They know their local markets. You know, there's the potential to also, um, you know, essentially they're acting as owners, not employees, which is what you always want. You know, but there's also the potential to expand very rapidly. Um, I mean, I can cite case study after case study of, businesses that have gone from five locations to 300 locations or 20 locations to 200 locations in a two to three year time period. You know, those are very, uh, that, that's rapid growth. You couldn't do just through corporate locations. You know, and also when you think about the long game, uh, you know, private equity absolutely loves franchising and they will pay a multiple for it for all the reasons that you just cited. So, I um, mean, yeah, I think th- those are good reasons. You know, having been a franchisor myself, I do want to caution that, Hey, you're going to wake up one day and, you know, you're going to have kids all across North America that have expectations of you, and you've got to make sure that you're staffed up and have the infrastructure to support to support you. You know, on the flip side, Stephen, one thing I'd point out is, you know, for people that are looking to, um, you know, purchase a franchise as, you know, versus a startup, you know, there's there's pros and cons there as well. You know, con would be maybe you're too entrepreneurial and you want to put your thumbprints all over a business. Well, there are some guardrails. You can't do that um, in franchising in, in most cases. Must maintain the brand integrity, for instance. But there's also the benefits of you've got a franchisor on the sidelines that's supporting you, essentially a coach. The better you do, the better they do. You've got other franchisees all across the country or North America that are living the same thing day in, day out, exchanging best practices with you. Um, you've got a playbook that shows you the path to profitability, and it's just all about going out and executing on it. So, you know, the franchising does allow for that starting on third base, not to be too cliche here, but, you know, versus having to create everything from scratch. Yeah. You know what? If I were to, I'm done starting business, I'm done starting businesses. I, I'm, I'm like, I'm, my businesses are doing well, so I don't need that. And, uh, you know, I'm 58 years old now and, you know, kind of, you know, just happy with the execution part of my businesses. But, 
if I were to do this, if I were to do it, I tell you what I would do. I would go out there and look for a business that could be franchised and I would buy that business or I might start a business that the ultimate goal was to be franchised. It's such a great model. It's just tremendous. And, you know, like the Jiffy Lube case study that we did, we met, you know, again, we met the owners of, I, I met the owner of uh, Jiffy Lube. He was, he was driving from a sales call that he was doing in Arizona and, and nowhere, and out of nowhere, he was driving down the highway just a long time ago. He saw this huge line for this place. And he's like, what's that? And he, he, he stopped off and he goes in and he sees this one first of its kind, quick oil change place. And he, he was so intrigued by it that he canceled his flight and stayed there for seven days <laughs> learning about the business, you know, and the rest is, is history, but um, it's a great, a great, great case study. Um, but, you know, so let, let's define too. So let's say you have an existing business. And you say, oh, you know, I, I believe what Steve and John is saying makes sense. What do you think the key ingredients are to franchising your business? Yeah, I think obviously you've got to have some unique or competitive advantage around it that people are going to see, <laughs> clearly see that value and therefore purchase, you know, your, your offering of a franchise versus going out and starting their own. Um, you know, I, I'd say one industry where I think it's a little clogged up would be mosquitoes. You already have a number of big brands, many of which are franchises in the mosquito industry. There's very little differentiation in there. It's very competitive space. You're competing on price. Whereas I think of, um, you know, other models where maybe there's something proprietary about the business that, you know, people can tap into and they see that value. Or maybe you have national accounts. You know, what is that secret sauce that you're able to offer to prospective franchisees that's going to attract them to the business. And I would say not just within your industry, but you know, when I think about our clients, oftentimes they're looking at 10 different opportunities, oftentimes in very different industries. You know, what's going to make your business jump out as a compelling opportunity? Obviously, it's got to check the boxes of the, 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 you know, the financial side of it. The return's got to be there. But then how do you articulate that competitive advantage that's going to make someone successful um, you know, versus some, you know, someone out you know, outside of that. So you know, oftentimes we're doing deals in blue collar industries, you know, oftentimes it's bringing a white collar approach to a blue collar industry. And maybe you've got, maybe it's not proprietary. Maybe you just have a outstanding marketing team or you put a call center in place. You've got all the technology stacked, you know, already lined up so someone can hit the ground running. I mean, that can be compelling. Um, you know, one other thing, Stephen, that I think about as a consideration would be, you know, your leadership team and how you're going to support those franchise owners. You've got to be ready to support them. You've got to be innovative. You've got to, um, you know, really go all out because you have people that are buying into your business and, and you want them to be pleased with their offering. You, you know, you don't want all of a sudden a couple of unhappy franchisees coming at you. Um, that, that, that's going to give you some headaches. And so one key piece I, I, I look at it, and oftentimes we work with emerging brands that are expanding is if you have more industry experience than franchise experience, I want to see you surround yourself with some strong franchise experience veterans. You have people that have been there, done that in their background, supported successful franchisees in their past with other businesses, because I think that's a unique element that until you're in it, you don't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know that. Um, so is it fair to say that, and I can see where this would rub, I don't know if that's the right word, rub the owner. It would be challenging for the owner. And that is, do I go to franchise way or do I just continue to grow this on my own, right? So I would assume that one of the criteria is for a, a successful potential franchise amongst a lot of other criteria is you got to be growing in, in pretty well, right? I mean, because if you don't have that growth, then your your product or service <laughs> isn't proven, right? So you you better be growing a lot. And I guess the decision that the owner has to make is, and that's the problem is that I, I've been involved in super fast growing businesses and you're so running around with your head cut off because there's so much to do because you're building processes and procedures and you're hiring and you're putting out fires, you're dealing with financing and growth and all these other things. And all of a sudden, what we're saying to you is, oh, now throw in franchising as a potential alternative for you 
it's a lot to think about, isn't it? Yeah, no, you have to staff up for it. And that may mean, you know, your team that's out there selling new franchise locations and supporting them. It could be an outsourced organization, a franchise sales organization or FSO. That's very common. Um, so there are ways to augment what you're currently doing to kind of keep you focused on your core business. Maybe you put a corporate markets team out there for your core business. It allows you to support then the, the new franchisees with their onboarding and, and getting up, uh, you know, positioned well. So, you know, a lot, a lot of ways of going about it. Um, you know, when you think about it that way, but no, it's not the right path for every business, but for a lot of them, it is. And, you know, Steve and I, I think about, you know, to your point on growth, you know, we just had our ninth client yesterday sign an agreement for um, fast growing gutter business. This is a business that went from 20 locations to over 250 locations in about a two year period, but it's a very well established leadership team that they've, I mean, they've got their T's crossed and their I's dotted. We've had doctors buying in. We had a Wall Street attorney. We've had corporate executives. We've ha had existing business owners, all different types of backgrounds attracted. And this is gutter installs. It's not gutter cleaning as much. You know, but it's a $6 billion industry, highly fragmented. And do they have, you know, just an amazing gutter that's so different than everyone else? No. But do they have the marketing team dialed in and the tech stack in the supply chain and the call center, you know, that's supporting their sales efforts? They do. And they're starting to build some national accounts. And, um, you know, I think being able to offer, you know, discounted product because they buy in bulk to the franchisees is attractive. And I look at their growth story. So their average franchisee, and these are really attractive numbers. Their average franchisee is doing 1.7 million in revenue. The prior year, they were doing 1.2. I love seeing that comp growth. You know, they're not just growing by locations, but they're growing in, in, in the same locations. And they're doing that at a 28% EBITDA bottom line margin. Wow. You're making roughly half a million for gutters. Wow. For gutters, and your all-in investments call it 200, 225. So you think about that from a return standpoint, yeah, yeah, cash yeah. on cash. You also have the exit potential, and you also you know, can write off expenses as a business owner. You couldn't elsewhere otherwise. So yeah, um, yeah. You, know, you ask why franchising is growing. I think more and more people are being exposed to opportunities like that. Here's and here's an example of what I what I said before, and that is if somebody has two hundred twenty thousand dollars to be able to pop down on a on a Got our franchise. That that guy or woman needs to be pretty successful, right? That you know that's not chunk chains. You know they're not. You're not going to get somebody who installs gutters who says, "Oh, I want this franchise now," right? They're self qualifying themselves, right? I'll tell you, I'm going to give you a different angle. I mean, it's it's weird uh, to look at it this way, but I think. Even if you don't franchise your business, if you look at what would I need to do to franchise my business, what would I need to do in operationally? If you if you do those things, and we'll we'll talk about that in a second. Regardless, if you go to franchise or if you if you if your if your organization is franchisable, it will make you a much better business. Okay, because what are the key ingredients of a franchise out, outside of what you said is you you probably are going to build really good processes and procedures because you have to do that. You have to if you're going to you have to be able to turn over a business that's a uh, what's the right word? Uh, cookie cutter. Uh, you know, it's it just it, someone just comes in and it's ready, ready to roll. What, what would be a terminology for that? Yeah, I'd say replicate. Replicate. Yeah, you're looking right? to replicate in a new market. Yep. Yeah. So you got to have your processes and procedures down really, really well, right? Number two is you got to have a, a lot of good employees, you know, management team that you talked about, right? Um, you you uh, you got to know your space like super well. These are all things, maybe you could add, these are all things that will make your business good regardless if you decide to go to the franchise route or not. Yeah. No, I, I put together a really interesting video recently for the Entrepreneurs Organization uh, that, that, that circulated around the world. And you know, we talked about franchising from a few different angles. We talked about um, you know buying a franchise and what to look for. We talked about franchising your business. We talked about franchising versus startups, franchising versus resales. Yeah, but there was a section in there where I hit on exactly what you said, it, franchising best practices. And it's a whole idea that, hey, even if you're not looking to get into franchising in one of these avenues, you know, by going through that process of how would someone outside the company and putting yourself in their shoes, essentially a prospective buyer, how would they think about the business? What would they be looking for? 
it kind of gives you some ideas to, to run with. And that's, you know, the SOPs, the standard operating procedures, as you mentioned, um, you know, things, but, you know, kind of your marketing guidelines and brand guidelines that, you know, you're thinking about how would we support another location? Maybe that this is a good practice to go through just if you're looking to expand to other corporate locations, corporate owned is, you know, essentially what, what's going to be needed so that someone really starts on third base, hits the ground running, um, you know, and, and, you know, you think about, again, the supply chain, be able to negotiate, you know, larger yeah. agreements because you have more buying power, the larger you get more locations, uh, you know, what's that technology stack, what's needed, what's not, it really helps you think through, you know, it's kind of, I, I like to think of it as a framework, a consultative framework of how you uh, analyze your current business, but it's also going to help you think about, you know, what other businesses make sense to add in, how do you expand the value of what you're offering? And, and that could be, uh, vertically or, or, or horizontally. Yeah. I wish I knew, I was just thinking, I wish I knew then what I know now, <laughs> you know, geez, save myself so much time and energy. And I mean, I've been, I've done well, but it's like, uh, you know, this is the other thing. It's, this is a side note. I'm just going to say, it. it's just like, I was talking to my business partner. Who's, who's amazing. He's my best friend too. And he, um, I said, you know, business is so much fun. Cause we're, I mean, I'm a 58, I've had uh, some issues. I, I just recently I got on in my personal life. Uh, you know, my wife passed. And, and so, you know, I'm trying to figure out what my next one third of my life is going to be about and not to get so you know, dramatic here. Um, but I, you know, I was like telling my business partner, I'm like, you know, cause originally I was thinking, man, I wouldn't, uh, maybe I just wouldn't do, um, maybe I won't focus on my business life as much anymore. And, and then I came back to him and I said, yeah, but it's so much fun. You know, I really enjoy it. And I've always kept a good balance of life, work, family, health. I've done a great job with that. So, um, but I would go to franchising route. I, I wouldn't buy, I, I'm going to be honest with you that John, I would never buy a franchise, <laughs> um, to, you know, because I'm an entrepreneur and it, like you said it so well, eloquently in the beginning, you know, you, you have restrictions when you're a franchise owner, right? Versus being an entrepreneur where you say, oh, I can do whatever I want. You know, it's my business. So um, so what do you, like, tell me some trends in industries. You mentioned the gutter one. So so what, what are you seeing that are unique trends outside of the food industry that are f- franchisable? Yeah. You know, and, and like I said, I mean, some people are too entrepreneurial and that may not be the right fit for you, but it's amazing, Stephen, the number of existing business owners that are saying, Hey, I've been there, done that for yeah. my next rodeo. I would rather, again, reduce have the things, risk, have things figure, reduce the risk. I mean, yeah. 92% of franchises are still in business after five years, a fraction of startups are. So, you know, better chance of succeeding, but not having to beat your head against the wall about, you know, figuring out certain things. I mean, I think of my client, Nathan, you know, he's 40 years old, largest franchisee of two minute and truck moving service. Every year he comes to me, he operates like 10 markets. Every year he comes to me and says, Hey John, what's our next thing? And we get him involved with a franchise that, that, that we think would be a good fit for him. He puts a young guy in charge, elevates him, you know, gives him that responsibility. He's built out this organization. In every case, he's come back and bought additional locations within the first 12 months of any deal that we've done. Uh And so he's building this empire and he said, hey, yeah, I could go start my own thing, but I mean, franchising is just a better path. And, you know, what's interesting too is a lot of our clients are existing business owners and non-franchise and then they come to us. Uh, But no, so to answer some of your trend questions, you know, I, I think. Trendy is non-trendy is the new trendy. <laughs> you know, people want those non-sexy businesses. It's understandable, cash-flowing, needs-based type businesses. Things that Amazon's not going to disrupt. In some cases, a recession or COVID's not going to disrupt. You know, it's things that they need. You know, it's your your aging parents. Well, there's a lot of providers of in-home senior care out there. Yeah, but there's one that we really like that has an amazing leadership team. They have a better mousetrap of how they're going about serving the clients, much better differentiated model. Um, You know, I think about, you know, those property services. You know, one thing that that we're seeing out there that I like today is, uh, and I wish more companies would do this, is offering a truly passive investor model. So typically in franchising, you have two different ownership models. One is an owner operator, you're running the day-to-day. One is semi-passive or what we call semi-absentee executives, another term for it. That's where you put a manager in place 
and you're kind of co-managing that manager with the franchisor. That's very popular. And if it's a good franchisor, they're supporting that manager. They're the technical resource for them. It takes a lot of the burden off of you. I mean, a lot of doctors that we work with, they're not looking to leave their W-2 high paying income, but they want to get exposure to business ownership. And they put that manager in place and then kind of tag team with the franchisor yep. to, to manage them. The final one, and this is something that I'm seeing growing, though it's still small today, is the offering of a franchisor managed business. So essentially, it's corporate managed, investor funded. Uh, there's one that I'm buying in Miami uh, next month. I'm buying a couple locations of a custom orthotics and insole business. They use 3D printing, cater to the older population, Medicare recipients. Um, but it's one where the franchisor is actually going to manage the business for me. I still have my name on the lease, still have you know, my checking account. But they're going to report back to me you know, via a Zoom call every month on how the business is doing, the KPIs. We're going to, you know, I'll be able to make the key strategic decisions at that time. Um, we've had clients buy into one that's in the insulation space. That's a $53 billion fragmented wow. space. And here's spray foam insulation. They will manage the business for, for our clients. There's a couple in the pet space that our clients have been buying into. So that's kind of the holy grail of ownership where you're a business owner, but you don't have to run the business. So um, we'd love to see more move in that direction, but that's kind of a, I don't like the term trend, but that's a direction that we're seeing more move. Yeah, it was interesting when I, um, you know, you mentioned the EO organization and I know um, I, I've been, my EO group, uh, my forum group has been together for 25 years. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not a member of EO, the organization anymore, but I was for a long time and I, I'm still with my forum group, but um it's interesting that I think about some of the guys that have been in my forum group and when their business failed, um, they, they often mentioned maybe I still want to be a business. I want to be an owner, but I want to reduce the risk. So maybe I'll look at the franchise route. Right. Um, you know, and then because, you know, that, you know, it's something my mentor had said, finding a good business idea is the, is one of the hardest parts of, starting a business um and you know it, he's right it really is and whereas the franchise model kind of takes all that's why they have a 92 percent sex success rate after five years or within five years right um so what I mean, you you've written some books right and and uh, what are your books about yeah, you know, I'll kind of finish the thought there. 90% of our clients end up purchasing something that was never on their radar that they had no background in. And so until you see something in front of you, oftentimes you don't know what you're looking for, but that's kind of where the magic happens, where we show 10 opportunities that are available in your market that check all of our criteria and your criteria. That's where the magic happens. Um, our book, Non-Food Franchising, came out a few months ago and would love to offer a free digital version to, to all of your um, listeners if you come out to our website. But no, the book, we, we hit on a number of things. We talked about franchising, you know, the power of franchising and why it's so popular today. We talked about the industries. We talked about the financials, both the funding piece as well as the returns. We talked about the legal side of franchising. Um, we hit on, there's a chapter on franchising versus buying an existing business, entrepreneurship through acquisition. You know, what are the trade-offs between those two? We talk about franchising versus startups. We talk about franchising an existing business. So we try to cover the gamut in about 95 pages and um, have really received positive feedback on, you know, it being a great next step for people that have an interest in learning more. Um, you know, we've been offering free digital uh, copies, as I said, you know, but certainly if anybody wants to buy it on Amazon, all profits go to a great nonprofit that we support. So um, I certainly encourage that as well. What about you? So, I'm a little confused. You, you mentioned this company that yeah. you, so what was your background? Yeah. You know, like so many of your listeners spent many years in the corporate world, had a great run, you know, Accenture and, and consulting, did some stuff in India, spent many years post grad school with uh, Carter's Oshkosh Bagash, children's apparel, worked with some of the largest retailers in the world. Um, you know, could have stayed there forever, but had that itch to do something different and didn't know what it was. And so, I uh, ended up leaving public company world for a private company, and that was Shelf Genie Franchise System, custom pull-out shelving for kitchens and pantries, and had the opportunity to serve as their president, supporting franchise owners all across North America. And for me, that was when the light bulb went off of, um, you know, hey, there's a, franchising is more than fast food. I just got to see firsthand how 
you know, we were able to create business owners with all different types of backgrounds and how successful they were. So um, ended up partnering with the founder of Shelf Genie. We spun off. We've invested in franchises ourselves. I've had other business partners we've invested. So, uh, you know, multiple brand franchisee now. So I've sat on both sides of the table. Um, you know, but Stephen, we've got good people running the businesses and allows me to spend over 90% of my time helping others do the same. What's the franchise model like overseas? Is it there? Yeah, it, it is. I'd say it's developing in a lot of countries. You know, certainly the regulations, everything are a little, uh, you know, a little more gray in a lot of those countries. You know, here you're regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, so you have to cross your T's, dot your I's. Um, you know, we, we do a good bit in Canada. You may not consider that overseas. I haven't personally done deals outside of the U.S. and Canada. Um, it's just a whole different gamut. But a lot of those bigger brands, when they say, hey, we're pretty saturated here in North America, let's look to expand. We also see a lot of a lot of brands in South America that are businesses that are becoming brands interested in entering the U.S. Um, I, I won't claim to be an expert on that space. I, you know, I try to stay in my lane, but that is something that I think we'll see more of in the future. Yeah. I, uh, what about um, like... My question was more geared toward, um, so my, my mentor, who was an older guy when I was younger, he said that a lot of people, when they traveled overseas years ago, years, you know, decades and decades and decades ago, would go there, they would see a business and they'd bring it back to the United States, right? And they'd start it here. So, you know, what is the franchise model, not for U.S. companies to go franchise overseas, it's for the franchising occurring in other parts of the world are, are there other parts of the world that are very advanced when it comes to franchising or is that very much an American thing? It, like so many things it, it's left America and has been embraced by many countries. Certainly some are heavier into that than others, but uh, you know, I think of Eastern Europe, uh, there was a great company out of Hungary that uh, was an e-learning type business, you know, very much like, um, uh, you know, some of the options that we have here in the U.S., but they had a great technology stack and platform that, um, you know, taught computer coding and training and development mm. to kids. And so they were looking to enter the U.S. through a master agreement. And that's how a lot of companies will enter the U.S. They don't pretend to understand the U.S. and local markets. Instead, they'll try to find a well-heeled investor, entrepreneur in the U.S. to essentially buy the rights to bring that business to the U.S., um, and then kind of set up shop and expand and be able to support franchisees from the U.S. home office. Um, yeah, again, this isn't overseas technically, but I think of the one that I just bought into personally in Minneapolis that's a concrete paving and line striping business. Um, that one started in Canada, kind of sold out the Canadian markets, entered the U.S., set up a U.S. headquarters in Houston just over a year ago. It's already brought on 70 owners representing about 250 territories in the U.S. Um, so, you know, there are different paths, but I think, it's wise for any of them to tap into U.S. franchise experience, and not try to go at it alone. Um, certainly, you have a lot of food concepts, you know, c coming yeah. in as well from other countries. Hmm. Makes me kind of want to go back to my business partner and say, "Let's go look for a business that we think is franchisable and buy it, and then, you know, go that direction." But I'm like, do I really want to spend? 60, 70, 80 hours or 58 years old kind of doing that, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good, it's a, you know, welcome to my world now that my world's been blown up, honestly. No, so, you know, Steven, Steven, you mentioned the business is fun and, and I absolutely agree with you and yet try to keep it balanced. But you know, part of, part of the fun is also getting to support and, and, you know, you get rewarded by, you know, helping others. And I, I think about, you know, my line of work, I'm very blessed to to do a whole lot of placements of clients. And, and, you know, we just, that's where I get my validation. When I see them coming back, buying additional locations or and buying additional brands, we do a lot of multi brand deals with clients or they'll refer their sister-in-law or brother, you know, that's what gets me excited and seeing their growth and their successes. And uh, to me, that's part of the fun of businesses is, is kind of helping others succeed and in some cases, leaving the corporate world, or in some cases, just expand their family you know, legacy, um, net worth wise. Yeah, it's, I agree with you. It's 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 great to look at a business if you have something that is more important or important outside of just the money you make. Um, like when I was thinking about the model, you know, one of the things 
All the businesses I've had, believe it or not, have been where I'm stuck in the office, right? And I'm, I'm a people person. And so you kind of my next go around, you know, whatever I'm going to do, whether it be f- for fun or whatever, for money or whatever, it's going to be, I want to get out. I want to be with people. And, you know, the, 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 the franchise model that you're talking about might allow me to combine two things that I feel I need, the, the uh, people and uh, business and making money. You know, so, you know, if you can do all those things, I, uh, if you can do all these things, uh, I mean, my, my, I mentioned my mentor a lot. My mentor says the best business people are the ones you, you think that uh, they have um, uh, competing interests that you think can't, you know, come together because they're separate and they make, they find a way to make them work. So, you know, making a lot of money and helping people, you know, if you have those needs, if you can make those two things work, it's pretty good life. So, um, well, great podcast today, John, you're a great speaker. I enjoyed speaking with you very intellectually stimulating for me. It was, it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I will give you the last word, John. Is there anything else you want to mention? Yeah, no, I, I just say, you know, happy to engage with any of your listeners, you know, especially if you're in the you know, interest, interested in looking at options, you know, for your local market to expand your current empire or to uh, start a new one. And uh, we, we've been very blessed to do more placements than anyone else in the country the past few years. So uh, entirely free to work with us. Um, we're funded by the franchise companies, very much like an executive search type model, um, but would love to, to help out. And if nothing else, share a copy of our book. So come out to franbridgeconsulting.com. That's F-R-A-N bridgeconsulting.com. Sign up for our newsletter. We'll send you a copy of our book. And uh, you know, if you're ready to take a next step, we'd love to uh, jump on a call. Yeah. So thanks for coming on today. And uh, so um, if you like today's podcast, please feel free to share it with a friend and also subscribe on your favorite podcasting apps. The Entrepreneur MBA podcast has over 400 episodes. I have great guests. I really do. Uh, you should really just listen to a lot of the guests. It's like an MBA program. Well, such as the Entrepreneur MBA program. So it's, what's our purpose? And um, if you really like today's podcast or any other past ones, please give us a five-star rating. It really helps us get the word out. And if you're looking for a line of credit for your business, please feel free to visit our website at fscreditline.com. Again, that's uh, FS as in Financing Solutions, creditline.com. Or you can call us at 862-207-4118. And uh, listen, my, my takeaway today is this. Run your business like a franchise uh, potential if you were going to franchise it. It will make your business better. I mean, you know, listen, I always looked at my business and say, if someone were to purchase my business, what would they want? All right. And I think that's the same thought process with the franchise model as well. You know, it's always a great idea to have great processes, procedures, and to have great people working for you. And I think that's uh, really can help your business grow um, and grow more than it normally would as well. Other than that, have a great day, everybody. Business is a lot of fun. Make sure you're having fun out there because what else is life for, right? Have fun.